Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Nerd podcast. I am your host Kaivalya Apte and we are back with another very interesting topic to discuss on this episode. We talk a lot about distributed applications on this channel. We talk about distributed databases, but today we are going to talk about geo distributed applications. To do that, I have invited Dennis from Yugabyte DB to talk about all the things around geo distributed application. uh what 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 does it mean why do we need them and the tech stack and how a simple java developer who has never worked on distributed application can actually develop one and deploy it to the cloud so with this um i think most of my viewers would know dennis if they have watched the previous episode that we did on postgres compatibility with yugabyte db uh, google spanner uh, cockroach db and other distributed sql databases uh but still let's start with a brief introduction so welcome dennis uh please add a little introduction for our viewers yeah, absolutely glad to be back glad to be back and i'm glad to see that your podcast your show is uh, picking up yes i think that like when we first met you had a, probably i was the fourth or fifth yeah uh on your list and right now tremendously so like a year later you I have a chance just to come back and just have a conversation with you. So congratulations. Thank you and so much. Folks, uh, those who are watching us, you're happy guys because the cost managed to kind of lure in many bright minds in our industry <laughs> just to come and talk on different data like sorry, not database technology, on various technologies, right? That span databases, yeah. APIs, streaming systems, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Talking about myself, those who uh made a mistake and uh, has not watched yet uh, <laughs> our first episode about the postgres sql compatibility my name is dennis and uh, i've been working with distributed databases and distributed systems for the last eight years uh so presently i'm with yugabyte that's a distributed database that is built on postgres sql and before that i was contributing daily to another distributed database apache ignite that one is designed for high performance and memory computing prior to the databases and distributed systems i was on the java development team at oracle and sun i was building gvm and gdk but that was long time ago long time ago <laughs> awesome yeah i am also very excited to have you back and thanks a lot for you know uh supporting me in the initial days so i could you know connect with more people and reach out to more audience so thanks a lot i am always grateful for that uh with this let's start with the you know the basics of our topic for today so geo distributed application so it's it's like it's kind of self uh, explanatory but you know let's define what do we mean by geo distributed application yeah and that's uh, the right question to start with so basically i think if you go ahead and google for geo distributed application you will come across several sources Mm -hmm. some of those sources like i i hope the first one would be from yugabyte because this is actually what we are dealing with even though we develop a database and those who select yugabyte be they in fact build geo distributed applications and we did mm -hmm. a great job by explaining this term but let's say before when i joined the company probably let's say if you would google for this term a year ago you would come across a resource from microsoft mm -hmm. uh, microsoft azure one of the portal explains how to build those applications and they did a wonderful explanation then explained it really uh, straight to the point a geo distributed application it's still an application that runs across several cloud locations mm -hmm. for high availability for speed and compliant mm -hmm. so generally that's an app that runs across several cloud region and then we have three hype words like availability speed and compliance mm -hmm. but then throw this conversation you and I will dive into the details just to explain what those hype words mean but the main thing to remember the same application that operates across several cloud locations yeah. or multiple data centers mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i mean uh, for any application that wants to serve uh, the customers globally they want to have these application instances running in different regions different uh, when i say region it's like geographical region so that makes that application like a geo distributed application right and these are this is the same application working in a distributed fashion uh and not only distributed within a region but across different regions uh 
with this you mentioned some of those buzzwords and i think these words are very important uh when we try to understand them so why do we need geo distribution right so let's start with let's say high availability uh so when we say with geo distribution you get high availability uh what do we mean yeah let's let's take let's take this example so imagine then that you and i we decided to found a startup company and that's not a typical you know high tech company we came up with some wonderful pizza recipe some secret sauce mm. and as but as a tech guys we want to launch this new pizza chain and one we want that pizza chain to run across to run on top of some let's say technical solution that mm-hmm. is reliable that is fast that lets us let's say to accept orders really quick and then yeah. just bake a pizza and deliver that pizza to the to the customers and let's imagine that we both live in berlin right mm-hmm. we live in berlin we want to launch the first pizza store somewhere in the city and there what we did we quickly created that service we created the application we used java with java developers and we selected database let's say that we already had experience with postgresql so we selected postgresql and yeah. it took like for us we took probably a month right to launch this to launch the service and eventually the hardest part was just to find their brick and mortar location just to buy different stuff and to find a, a chef who will be who would be baking the pizza following our recipe mm-hmm. after the first logic is we have be a startup like we don't have enough money we, we launched that pizza store we've got the first customers those who came to our pizza store they were excited like the mm-hmm. recipe is wonderful it's just it's hard to beat it it's something exceptional and their the berlin right berlin berlin like knows about this like, this pizza mm. store right now we are getting let's say hundreds of customers daily and our solution that runs in one of the europe west cloud regions is kind of getting a significant significant load mm-hmm. we already had let's say to upgrade our solution several times for instance we upgraded from one vm to another we upgraded let's say our backend system frontend system we upgraded postgres just right now so the postgres database can get more cpus and storage space and so far so good probably let's say once we decide to open several more locations in berlin or in other european cities we need to consider something else right but in the meantime all is fine we are enjoying the first success we feel that luck and then suddenly let's say the winter storm comes mm. and the data center in europe west goes down it goes down for probably four hours because let's say some infrastructure is down or they just lost the power mm. it happens it happens really frequently especially considering the climate change right now and the, what it means for us like we were down our pizza store was down for four mm. hours customers would come they could not order like they would probably order something we would write something on paper we cannot take cash we can big bake the pizza but we cannot take cash we cannot deliver and that's the problem so the problem mm. was that yes we designed a pretty good solution we had the backend in java uh we used postgresql database all of the components are reliable but we trusted a cloud region we deployed everything within a single cloud region and mm. that cloud region went down so yeah. we took we learned the lesson with you when the cloud region was restored our business was restored and then we kind of sat down and we decided how do we deal with this we want we don't want this to happen because it hits us badly reputation mm-hmm. loss of revenue etc so eventually but we have the code and we decided to deploy our application across multiple locations and it's easy to do our backend our backend is stateless you know mm-hmm. just some spring boot application that uses spring data or hibernate or another favorite or a framework it's easy to deploy yeah. you can deploy it in containers across multiple locations and we mm. went ahead and we deployed in the us west region and we deployed in other regions nearby but and that's good so we solved let's say the problem from the application standpoint mm. but then also we need to do something with the database in postgres there are several let's say sharded solutions mm. It might be a good solution. It might be not. But then we can we can review with you, let's say, the database later. But imagine right now the fact that it's possible to deploy your database across multiple regions in such a way that 
in each region, each region can serve both reads and writes. So your database mm -hmm. is scalable and the database scales both reads and writes. So this yeah. is how a geo-distributed application and geo-distributed application can consist of the backend layer, API layer, streaming layer, the database layer. So the first step is to go beyond, let's say, a single availability zone or go beyond a singular region so that yeah. you don't face these outages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I really like the example of uh, having a pizza uh you know pizza service uh and you know we ha we already have it like a secret sauce and people love it and customers would be really pissed off if they can't order their pizza especially when they are hungry so we don't want any downtime and we trusted uh we as java developers built everything correctly because uh we had postgres database we had our application which was pretty resilient we handled all the corner cases but then we forgot that you know even the cloud provider or the region itself can go down and without of uh, you know any of our fault our business was down and we don't want that so that's like a primary reason to you know expand our business and move outside the availability zone but i think the key part you mentioned was it's still a single application these are not like two separate applications deployed in two availability zones but these are still serving as one single application no matter mo or what how you know, far apart they are. And you mentioned that also the database itself is, you know, distributed uh, in a way that uh, the, the data is served as a single application. So still the, the experience from the user's perspective who are coming to our application and ordering the pizza, it's still the same. They don't care where it is deployed, of course, but they get high availability. Even if one region goes down, the other region is able to serve the request. Uh, with this, let's move to, you know, the other part when you said uh, latency or performance improvements with, uh, you know, with geo distributed. So when I have multiple availability zones, how does it impact my latency? How does it improve the performance? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so here is probably, you know, like before we dive into the performance aspect of the geo distributed applications, let's kind of share some numbers with our listeners when it comes mm. to high availability yes that example that i gave about let's say data center that runs our pizza services down it's not it's not out of my imagination mm. generally speaking even if to take amazon web services alone amazon experiences a major outage at least once a year mm. and the major outage is a region level outage mm. the reasons might be different it can be, let's say, just a power loss, some natural incident, hurricane, tornado, blizzard, whatever it happens. Mm. Sometimes it can be something like there is. There was one well-known and notorious incident when Amazon S S three in East Coast went down for multiple hours. It happened because one of the Amazon employees he was doing, you know, some running some operational commands, and he missed up with mm. an argument. Yeah, and that cascaded some failure that impacted, let's say, the entire S3. And S3 is used in so many secondary services yeah. that it's like impacted almost everyone. So this yeah. also happens. So the many reasons. And on average, if to believe to, if to refer to Amazon, I mean, on average, it can take up to four hours to restore from a major outage. Mm. And again, here is we're not blaming Amazon. Amazon actually does a great job by explaining, documenting all of those outages. Yeah, they have a special and and. I think that we can share that page. They have a special post-mortem page mm -hmm. where they document all of those outages. Yeah. And we as developers, we need to use this as a reference because Amazon, like Amazon and any other cloud provider, they come with abundant infrastructure. Yeah. You literally have infrastructure that spans the globe. Mm. And Amazon and other cloud providers, they have the services that can operate across multiple regions. S3 can operate across multiple regions. Mm. Those who were running S3 or dependent services in other cloud regions of Amazon, they were not impacted by that outage in the East Coast, right? Uh, and we, like or Amazon, like some, some streaming service, it's also gonna be multi-region. Mm -hmm. We just need to take a look what Amazon does and other cloud providers do. 
and do the mm. same when it comes yeah. to our applications, to our backends, to our databases, if you don't use, let's say, a database or a cloud provider. And another statistic says that if to take all of the cloud providers, as an example, let it be Amazon, Microsoft, Google, or IBM, Oracle, on average, a major incident happens every 50 days, mm. like in any of the clouds. It's like, and you never know, like you, you might be lucky enough. Yeah. And you might not be impacted by any cloud region outage, let's say the next year, the next two years or three years, yeah. but this day can come. And we as developers, we just need to accept the fact that an mm. outage can happen in the region where we are running our applications. And then are you ready to be down let's, for several hours? Because for some people it might be okay, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you are not ready to be down for four hours or more, then you are better to run across multiple regions. Mm. Another example, let's say, if you are ready to be down, let's say, for four hours and you don't want, let's say, because of those potential four hours outages to be down, then at least deploy across multiple availability zones within your region. Because zones fail all the time. Mm. And there is a reason why every cloud provider has at least three availability zones in each region. Yeah. Because the cloud provider accepts that zones fail all the time. Mm. You have to run across at least several availability zones. Yeah. If you cannot allow multi-hour outages, then you have to run across multiple regions. So that's that's a little bit of a step back so that like our listeners understand that, that example uh, when we talked about high availability. Yeah. But now, right now, let's go to your next question, the latency. Because once you deploy your solution across multiple regions, mm. then certainly you can get a, a performance hit if let's say your application has to communicate across all of those regions. But it depends like how far those regions are away from each other. Mm. Let's say if we run if we run one data center somewhere in Germany and another one in the United Kingdom, then probably the latency would be the round trip latency, I don't know, might be around 40 milliseconds or 45 mm -hmm. milliseconds. I don't know probably around those ranges. And that might not be a big deal mm. for most of the applications. Yeah. But from the application standpoint, let's say you deploy, if you design your application as stateless, it doesn't really matter which application instance processes your request. Yeah. What matters is how, let's say, your streaming platform is deployed, if you need to stream data across those regions, or mm. how your database is deployed. With databases, we have several deployment options that we can discuss later. But from the application standpoint, I think that's the easiest way. So for you as a developer, you just deploy those application instances because of those locations and those instances can process the local traffic. So let's take this example. We, you and I, we launched our startup, our pizza store in Berlin, but right now mm. we decided to expand to London. Yeah. The folks from London won't, can't wait to get our, a slice of our pizza with that special mm. recipe. And we go ahead and we deployed an application instance. So right now we have two application instances, one somewhere around Berlin and another one somewhere around London. What do we do with our mobile application? Because and we have a pizza store, right? And we, we probably don't want to run a separate infrastructure. We just have those instances. We can monitor them. We can manage. We can scale. But we have, let's say, mobile apps. People, we have front end. Our customers can order everything from a specific locations by going to a website. Mm. And we don't want our front end on mobile application to remember all of those IP addresses of those instances. Yeah. And as a solution, what can we do? We, every cloud provider has a wonderful service called Global Cloud Load Balancer. Mm. Imagine that you can deploy a load balancer slash proxy and that proxy and load balancer can be accessed from any point in the world. So you deploy the proxy and load balancer, it's given a public IP address, and you can get to this public IP address from London, from Berlin, from Singapore, from whenever you like. Mm. And then you can configure that load balancer in such a way that the load balancer decides what applic which application instance is going to serve this user request. So let's yeah. say that you and I, we live in Berlin and we decided, all right, let's, let's go and order a pizza from our own pizza store. Mm. I, I open mobile phone and the mobile phone connects to the back end, but the connection goes through that load balancer, single IP address or single host name. Yeah. And the load balancer sees that I live in Berlin 
And mm-hmm. I have an application instance that runs in Berlin. So the load balancer will send this request to that instance, not to London. So that's going to be from the latency standpoint, that's wonderful. And yeah. I have the data. It, I run my database in such a way that all of the orders that belong to Berlin, they are stored in the database nodes that are somewhere around Berlin. Mm. So I don't need to go for data to London, right? I don't yeah. need to read data. I don't need to put orders in the database node. So and the latency will be extremely slow, even though my, let's say, whole solution already runs across two locations, London and Berlin, and I have database nodes in London and Berlin, the latency still will be low because load balancer gets the user request, load balancer sees the time from Berlin, the application instance from Berlin starts processing this request, and the data is read, is read and written into the database nodes that is also located in that location. So the latency will be low, probably around five or 10 milliseconds for the round trip. So this mm-hmm. is how a geo-distributed application solves the performance problem. And the same stands true for our customers. Let's say we have customers in London, when they will be ordering pizza online or at the register, the latency also will be low because the instances of the database and application from London will be handling those application requests. Hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, and yes, latency is one of the critical parts uh, which derives or which drives the you know uh, the user experience. Uh, if uh, if your API or your application is not very responsive, and I have to wait, uh, let's say, a lot of seconds just to order my pizza, then there's a high chance that I might just order somewhere else or I might just order something else, right? So as a competitor pizza delivering service, uh, we want our service to be fast and we want our service to be highly available. So yes, high availability and latency both makes a lot of sense for our application. You mentioned some of the critical uh, points here. And one of them is, of course, the global uh, globally distributed load balancer. Uh, so when, let's say I'm in Berlin, I want to order pizza, I go to my app, I search for pizza. The first request goes to the load balancer. So the load balancer itself is located in Berlin. And there's another instance of load balancer, which is located in London. How that is distributed along with the application is how that is configured when, when I deploy my application. So actually, yeah, here is we need to get a, to the topic of the cloud networking. Because hmm. if you, let's say, if, if to take Google Cloud Platform, we already talked about Amazon, let's talk about another cloud provider. Yeah. If you talk about Google Cloud Platform, as an example, hmm. if you go to their webs, to their web page explaining how to configure the global load balancer and what that beast is, they would say that, you know, it's just, you know, it, it turns globally, but how does it work, right? The question is, how does it work? How is it possible? that it works yeah. through, like, from any location. And it depends on the premium network of the cloud provider. Mm. So in there, if like Google has the standard network tier and the premium network tier, what mm. does the standard one mean? Uh, let's say our solution is deployed in Google Cloud Platform. Our database runs there, our application instances, our API layer, everything is in Google Cloud. Yeah. But then, like, imagine that we decided our first version, let's say that our first version was running without cloud, cloud load balancer. That was before that first outage that convinced, mm. it, that convinced you and me just to deploy our application across multiple locations, at least for the high availability purposes. Yeah. And that time we used standard network because standard mm. network is cheaper, but how it works. Let's say that when you, when your when your application when my application instance is de- I deployed in Google Cloud Platform, and then I had a I had a customer from Berlin. First, when the customer from Berlin does a network request from the mobile application, this network re- request eventually will get to the Google data center to the Google network, but it can make several network hops uh, through several let's say yeah cloud provi- like not cloud providers internet providers. Hmm. Imagine that we also, when we deployed application and database instance in London, we decided to scale, right? But probably the first two days we were not using the global load balancer. Then let's say you have a customer in Berlin 
or like in London, and that customer in London also wants to get to my instance in London, but then again, several multiple network hops across the public network before it gets to Google. And that's the problem because let's say you might have a customer beyond London, like in some other distant locations. And before they get to their instance in Google, fast private network, it needs to make several round trips across their internet providers. Yeah. But when you deploy a global load balancer, you have you had to switch to the premium network. So with the, with the premium network, Google has the concept of point of presence. It's think about a gateway, a quick gateway teleport to the Google private network that is mm. nearest to your location. Okay. And right now, imagine that we we launched, we opened, we opened, let's say the pizza, the pizza store in London, but we have not deployed our application instance and database not there yet. We just have still somewhere in Europe, where somewhere around Berlin. Yeah. And when someone from London wants to order our pizza, then the, the load balancer, when you request the load balancer, then the network request will get to that load balancer through the nearest point of presence. Mm. And it should be somewhere in London. It's like, let's say, a gateway to the Google private network. From that location, it will travel through a fast connection private network of Google to our instance in Berlin. Yeah. It's, let's say, like a subway station. You go under the ground, you hop on the train, and then you take the minimal number of stops. You just you know travel from one way like, to another, from point A to point B. Yeah. Without the premium network, it would remind you more of the ground transportation. Eventually, let's say from London, you want to get to Berlin, your request from London wants to get to Berlin. With the ground transportation, what do you want to do? You first will probably take several uh, buses to get yeah. from point A to point D to point Z. Then you need to take a ferry to get from, their, from the island to the mainland somewhere mainland. in France, right? And then from France, you also need to gain probably some trains, etc. until you get to the point of presence of the Google network in Germany. Mm. And this is the launch road. This is the road you take with the standard network. And this is what the load balancer relies on. It relies on the private network that is fast, and it relies on those POPs, point of presence, that are close to the customer. Mm. And if you open uh, the map of the Google network, you will will see that there are so many points of presence around the world. Usually at nearby every major metropolitan area, you have the gateway, a quick gateway into the, let's say, Google Cloud private network. And once you're in the private network, you can quickly get access to the load balancer. And as long as the load balancer understands the private network, it knows, like when you configure the load balancer, you're telling, right, load balancer, these are my application instances. And those application instances can be running in as many cloud regions as you want. In our case, right now, we run them in Berlin and we run them in London, in those mm-hmm. locations. But then once we decide, once you and I, we decide to expand to the United States, we will tell the load balancer, All right, we are opening the first pizza store in New York City. And also as part of that opening, we want to deploy a database node and we want to deploy an application instance in that location. You just go ahead yep. and you update the, uh, the configuration of your load balancer and you're telling, All right, if you're getting the traffic from New York City, we are already on the private network. All of the requests will go through the nearest point of presence to the load balancer somewhere in the US East Coast. And then the load balancer will redirect all of their requests to their instance of the application in that location. So a little bit lengthy mm-hmm. explanation, but what folks you need to remember is that global load balancer truly relies on the private network of your cloud provider, on the private premium network of the cloud provider, and the premium network is like usually distributed around the globe. And every major metropolitan area has a point of presence. That's, let's say, a gateway, a quick gateway into the premium uh, network of your provider. And once you are there, the load balancer can quickly uh, redirect uh, the traffic to your application instances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, that's also a great tip while choosing your cloud provider and, you know, understanding how the networking itself works. Because your intentions might be correct while choosing a cloud provider and distributing your application across availability zone. But if you end up 
having all these different hops just to get into the uh, cloud provider, then maybe you're not gaining enough. You're just, you know, adding more complexity. But if you know how to get the access to premium uh, networks and how to, you know, reduce the latency just to reach the uh, cloud provider, then it can make a huge difference. Uh, so that's a, that's a great tip. And that's kind of explains how the networking part works uh, when it comes to uh, the global load balancer. And with this, we also explain how the latency would be low if you have a server of your application or an instance of your application running right like closest to you uh, the more distance you you have to cover the more time it will take it's basic you know uh, physics uh, and that's what we are talking about here so great i think we have covered two buzzwords here uh, availability and uh, latency uh, for geo distributed applications let's talk a little bit about compliance because that's a different one and i've seen in many places these days, compliance with GDPR, it's becoming, you know, very popular, very customers are very demanding that they, they <laughs> want their data confined within uh, some some boundaries of geographical location. Uh, so how does geo distributed application help us with compliance? Yeah, GDPR, I mean, is, is the number one example, right? And we are, but like, we as the founders of the pizza store, we are GDPR compliant by definition. Because yeah. where we launched, let's say we launched our chain in Berlin and London, and right now probably we're expanding across the Europe, mm. Paris, let's say Madrid, other locations, uh, or Rome. And all is good because we keep all the customer data, personal data, within the boundaries of the European Union. So happy we are. But let's say that our pizza chain is getting traction. Like people start talking about it. And uh, we were approached by two enthusiastic people from India mm. who want to buy a franchise from us and launch the pizza store in Bangalore and Mumbai. Why not? Mm. We yeah. don't want to operate the business there. So we are ready to educate them. We are, we are not going to share the recipe of the pizza, but we will kind of mix all the ingredients in the proper way. Hmm. And they will, we will educate them how to sell, etc. But we are going to run the service. We yeah. are going to monitor and manage our own uh, technical solution. Hmm. And when it comes to India, how is it related, let's say, to the compliance? So what I actually learned a few months back that Probably several years ago, uh, the Reserve Bank of India, they actually signed an order that requires to store all their information about payment transactions in India. So let's say if you have a customer who lives in Mumbai or Bangalore, and that customer buys a pizza from us, and probably in the beginning, we were thinking with you, all right, let's keep using, let's say, the infrastructure that we already have in Europe, and then we will... We are already geo distributed. We will kind of probably a month or two later, we will just scale to that location, database and application instances. It's quick, but let's mm -hmm. do it later. But no, that kind of might be a problem for us because if we've got our first customers in Bangalore and they buy this pizza, the payment information about those purchases have to be stored in India and not in Europe. Other, if mm -hmm. we don't do this, we are violating that data compliance and regulation law, and we can get out mm. of business as quickly as we've got yeah. into that country. So what's interesting about that law, I don't know like the details, but what I uh, learned so far by talking to some of my colleagues, the payment processing, the compute can take place in Europe. Mm. But then you have, let's say, several hours window to store the payment information uh, in the data centers in India, not mm. in Europe. Yeah. So, but for us, man, we are already geo distributed. We learned yeah. how to do this with our application backend, with our API layer, with our database in Europe. And for us, it's not a big deal just, let's say, to deploy application instances in one of the data centers in India and to mm -hmm. do the same with the database. Yeah. So, once we do this, the database nodes and the application instances can serve both the compute and the storage of the data in India. And this is how we can mm. stay compliant. And this is how we can grow, let's say, much, much faster even in, in India because there I bet we will get many more customers that we've got uh, in Europe. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's an example uh, 
of how this geo-distributed solution helps uh, with the data regulatory requirements. But here is it's important to talk about the database because I keep talking about, let's say, how do we deploy database? How do we deploy database? Because from the application backend standpoint, it's all easy. You arrange, you put, you, you put your application instances you can put in India. You can put in. Uh, you can in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in Spain, I don't know, mm. in France, in the United States. But and it's easy. And then you just set up your global load balancer. You use the private network, and this is how you achieve high availability and performance. It's going to be fast. It's going to be reliable. Mm. And but what do you do with the database? With the database. We don't have a silver bullet solution because uh, databases are different. Uh, we cannot deploy, let's say, just one single cluster across mm -hmm. Europe and India because the latency yeah. will be high. I think the latency yeah. between, let's say, the Germany and Mumbai can be as high as like 150 milliseconds or even not more. Mm. It's, it's, yeah. it's way too much. Yeah. It doesn't work. What we can do, several options. And those options, and everyone can pick between those options depending on their use case. You can have your primary database instance deployed in one cloud region, let's say in Germany. And then if all you need is to accelerate reads, read requests, then you can deploy read replicas in other yeah. locations. You can deploy mm -hmm. a read replica in Mumbai, you can deploy a read replica in London. And this is usually one of the first moves for those who expand globally across uh, several cloud regions. Yeah. But the problem with that is that replicas are replicas. They have the stale data and they improve on the reads. So like those customers of us in India who would be, let's say, buying pizza, the read requests, when they will be searching through the product catalog of our pizza chain, they mm -hmm. will be fast. But all of the writes, they, yeah. will be, they will go through the primary instance. It's slow, plus we are still not compliant with the rules of the Reserve Bank of India, the payment mm -hmm. stored in Europe, the yeah. payment information. This is replicas, but keep in mind, read replicas are wonderful. So for our pizza chain, that's not the way to go. But from other application standpoint, it might be a wonderful solution. You have, let's say, your primary database instance deployed across several availability zones of a region or multiple close regions in close proximity. And then you can attach read replicas in distant locations, such as the United States, South America, Australia, or South Asia. It's easy. What else? What if I want to accelerate both reads and writes? And what if I want to become compliant with, uh, uh, with the government, right? Mm. Another, another approach that we have been using for ages is multiple standalone database clusters. So let's say that we have one database instance that can span across multiple uh, local regions in Europe and we have another database instance in India. Those are standalone. It's like yeah. Every store, every dist every every distant location has its own database. Yeah. So the beauty of this solution is that, like, yes, you have these different uh, database instances. The requests will be fast. You will be compliant with the local regulations, etc. But if you need to run queries across several databases, let's say for business decision making, right, or for some analytics. Your you need to query multiple databases. You need to merge this data. You need to join the data. You need to use some third-party data federated query solutions, which can be problematic. Yeah. Again, so this is a doable solution even for our pizza store, but we want to have something more sophisticated, something that is easier to run. And some of the databases they support another type of geo-distributed deployment called geo-distributed database deployment. So in this case, let's say you have a single database cluster. Let's say we have a database cluster that spans across London, Berlin, and Mumbai, mm -hmm. three locations, and we have nodes in all of those locations. Mm -hmm. But the data that belongs to India is stored only on the nodes from India. Yeah. And the same stands true for the orders from Germany. All of the orders that belong to our stores in Germany, they are stored in the data center that is close to Berlin. Mm. How do we do this? There is no any magic. There is always a trade-off. We as application developers, we need to help our database to decide where an order should be, a pizza order should be located and served from. Yeah. To do that, let's say we have our pizza, pizza, pizza orders table. And to the table, we introduce a new column. Let's say this column is named region. 
it can be a custom name, it can be called data center, it can be called city, whatever you like. But for our example, yeah. region. Mm -hmm. And depending on the value of that column, the database will automatically place our data in one of their existing locations. So let's say mm -hmm. if the value of this column is set to India, then all of the updates, inserts, and selects for those records where the region is equal to India, they will be served, served from the nodes that are nearby Mumbai. Mm. The same stands true, let's say, that if you say that region is the United Kingdom, and all of those pizza orders, updates, inserts, selects, they will be served from the nodes that are deployed uh, on that island yeah. and not in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And that's a single cluster. So that's a single database connection endpoint. So our application instances, let's say you have multiple application instances, United Kingdom, Germany, and India. But all mm. of those application instances, they open database connection through the same IP endpoint. But then the database, when you run your request, the application runs the request, the application passes the value of the region. And based on the value of that region, the database automatically routes the requests to one of your locations. So mm. to summarize, let's take this example. We opened, we opened uh, the pizza store in Mumbai and we've got yeah. the first thousands of customers. Mm. So when those customers buy at the counter or order online, all of those requests go where? To the load balancer. The load balancer redirects those requests to the application instance that is in uh, Mumbai. And that application instance is connected to our geo-distributed database that has nodes across several countries. But our application, when it puts a new order or updates a, a status of an order or serves any other data, it passes the value of the region to the database. In the database, like as part of the selector update statement, and the database serves or puts all the data in India. So the latency will be low. You go to the load balancer, probably a few milliseconds. The load balancer is already within the premium network of your cloud provider. That yeah. premium network quickly goes to your application instance, and that application instance goes to the nodes of the database that are deployed in India. It's like mm. literally just 5, 10, or 15 milliseconds for both reason right. Yeah, and this is how you scale in the geo distributed way, hmm. right? So, yeah. another example, absolutely. So, uh, many, many great points there. I mean, first, I would like to uh, say that, yeah, I agree, it's a great idea to launch a pizza service in India, but definitely we need to change our <laughs> secret sauce. The same spice levels that we use in Berlin might not work in India, that, that's yeah, for exactly. sure. And then, uh, there's a lot of competition, but you know, that 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 uh, kept apart. You talked about, you know, how you can, for our application, we thought about, you know, geo distribute, just geo distribution right from the beginning, right? We made all those choices of, you know, using a global load balancer and, you know, having those regions in our tables so that I can make decisions based on the region. And then I can select a certain database deployment strategy. So you, you mentioned about read replicas, which can be useful when you just want to scale reads and you don't worry a lot about writes, but there's always issue because you, these are replicas, there will be replication lag. If you have too many writes, of course the writes itself is slow. So if you have, you know, use cases where the write itself needs to be faster, then that solution won't work. And then the second thing you talked about was uh, having like a separate cluster deployed for each location that that works well. I mean, uh, you don't have a problem for the basic use case, but then of course, whenever you want to launch your pizza service to a new country, to a new location, you have to have a new cluster set up and all that complexity. Also, you cannot write all those queries across, like to understand the big picture, what, what, how my service or how my pizza company is doing globally. I want to write some SQL queries. And now I cannot do that because I have separate databases. So that again is a is a different channel. So I need some another complicated solution to kind of merge data and you know uh, give me like a unified view across these database clusters. So that itself is uh, another yeah, problem. That's, that, that's a wonderful summary and point. And actually, what you highlighted with those multiple standalone clusters, if you for any reason need to get let's say the data from Europe 
for the database in India, you are dealing with a synchronous replication. Mm, I mean, absolutely. With the geo distributed deployment, it's not the case. Usually, yeah. you deal with the synchronous replication, but usually you don't synchronize across distant locations because the data is usually stay locals. When you update, yeah. you're usually dealing with the orders from India, and all of those orders are stored on the nodes from that region. Mm. So, which and the synchronization, synchronous replication in that region is fast. It's like, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Sorry and, for interrupting. Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. I, I think that was a great point. And uh, talking about compliance, as as you mentioned, uh, since I was talking about, you know, deploying separate database clusters for each country. So let's say I'm not thinking of geo distribution uh, from compliance standpoint right from the beginning. Uh, and let's say I have a pizza service. I'm hosting all my data in, let's say, Germany. I don't care a lot about latency. But then suddenly uh, some government you know, applies this law that, okay, the data cannot move outside a certain country. And then what you do, you need to deploy like a new cluster of database, move all that data and change entire application the way it works. So it's, in my opinion, if you're building an application in today's world, it's best to think about geo distribution. If you have plans to, you know, grow uh, in, in global terms and not just to a, to a single country. Uh, so because compliance can change a lot it depends a lot on, you know, political and economical uh, and, you know, other, other scenarios. So it's best to think about those. Talking about the database part, I want to focus a little bit more on, you know, the modern databases that we have that supports geo distribution based deployment models. And, you know, uh, without having the application developer focus a lot on, you know, the complexities of how things would work, how the data is distributed. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the options that I have in terms of databases. How do I make a choice? Like, let's say I started with Postgres. How do I make a choice? Uh, I know we did a episode on Postgres compatibility. So I would want to move to a database that is Postgres compatible. So if you want to learn more on Postgres compatibility, I would point you to the other episode that we did. But for now, how would you, uh, like, what is the thumb rule? to decide on uh, the type of database I would go for uh, when I when I want to focus on geo distribution. So what are some of the criteria or traits of a database I should look for? Yeah, it's all about trade-offs. Let's say that you started with Postgres and Postgres is actually it's a very wonderful solution. You can carry on with Postgres for as long as you like. Yeah. Because uh, there are many extensions and there are many add-ons to Postgres that allow you to run Postgres replica nodes mm. or multiple Postgres <clears throat> instances, like it's called like sharded Postgres, right? And then you can decide whether you want to synchronize or not. You have the master or standby deployment. But let's take, let's say, this simple approach. Let's say, let's take from the developer perspective. If you selected Postgres and you are, you were happy with Postgres for a while, but then the business keeps growing and you have to take care about availability, high availability, because you cannot afford you're selling something, let's say, tangible to yeah. the customers. And not mm. even tangible, something yummy, 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 right? <laughs> you're selling pizza. And if they come to us, they want to eat pizza. They don't want to be told that, right, our pizza store is shut down right now. And they would tell, come on, what are you talking about? I see that you have this, like, the own is here. Why don't you bake it to me? Like, my, my, my system is down. Ah, it's like, what the heck? So the first thing you would think about is high availability. And, and many go with uh, the master standby cluster. You can deploy, let's say, you can use a cloud service. You can you can do this on your own. Uh, you can have the primary Postgres instance and that instance accepts, let's say, changes asynchronously or synchronously depending on the distance, right, from the region, from the primary instance. And then when the primary goes down, you can switch to the standby cluster. Mm -hmm. The question is, like, what's your RTO? Like, how, how, how long are you ready to wait before that failover happens? Yeah. And... Uh, and what's your synchronization? Is it a synchronous or synchronous? Because if it's a synchronous, you can lose some of the updates, right? Your your primary instance can go down before all of the changes yeah. get replicated to the secondary one. Mm -hmm. So in this case, think about those trade-offs. If you, if let's say take Amazon Aurora as an example, because Amazon Aurora, you can uh, have the typical use case. You you have the primary node, reader and writer in one mm -hmm. cloud region, yeah, and then you deploy read replica nodes in other regions. And this is how you protect yourself from region level outages. 
if you are not lucky and your region with the primary instance goes down, then it can take, uh, I don't know, probably dozens of minutes, a lot of time yeah. before the, one of the Amazon read replica nodes gets promoted to the primary instance. And then you mm. hopefully everything is good from the data consistency. Everything gets replicated. I don't know. But anyway, get to, be ready to wait for 10, 20, 30 or more minutes outages. Because it can, it depends on how big your database. It depends on some other criteria. So, but yeah. be ready to be down for let's say for dozens and dozens of minutes. Yeah. The read replica nodes. So in this case, but what 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 this use case again? You are already fault tolerant, but your application, your store might become unavailable for dozens of minutes, if not a half an hour. Yeah. And there. But if you decide, but if you operate, let's say, from one location, such as Berlin, that might be good for you, right? But once you decide, let's say, to scale across different countries, you you would better, let's say, let's say to look at different to, to solutions that offer both high availability and they scale both reads and writes. Mm. In this case, you can deal with distributed databases. Like Yuga by DB is built on Postgres, which means that you're so your migration can be the easiest. If you want to pick something else, for instance, Google Spanner or Cockroach DB, they are PostgreSQL wire level compliant. So basically they understand Postgres protocol, but they do not implement all of the all of the features of Postgres. So you can consider them as an option in such a way that you deploy your database across multiple cloud regions. And then you scale both reads and writes. And if one of the regions goes down, you're good because you have nodes in other region. So this is how it's the second option, right? To deploy a single, you can deploy a single database cluster across multiple regions. Yeah. And if, let's say, you operate in in Berlin, in Paris, etc., you might deploy, let's say, a single cluster across those distant locations. And and probably it's going to be fine if, let's say, you up, you put an order in Berlin and then you need to synchronously copy this order to Paris because of the high availability requirements, the building node can go down, but that might define the latency is not that high. Yeah. We are in Europe. But then let's say you go, you grow beyond Europe, you go to India, right? Or you decide to deploy to the United Kingdom where the sea uh, just is between your data center and your customers. Mm. In this case, Probably a single distributed SQL database across the world is not a good way to go. In this mm. case, you have two options. Multiple standalone clusters. This is what you highlighted wonderfully. You just, let's say, deploy one distributed database cluster in Europe, another one in India. Do this. And then probably if you want to synchronize data, you have a synchronous replication. As a disadvantage, as a summary, if you need to query data from several separate clusters, that's on you. You can use, I don't know, there are multiple solutions for federated queries. I even remember, you can use Spark. Like Spark is like that old good solution that can connect to multiple databases and they offer the federated queries capabilities. Or you can use something modern, something more advanced, or you can implement everything in your code. Uh, and final one is, and in this multiple standalone solutions, you can use any pretty much any database. Right? It can be Yugabyte DB, it can be Spanner, it can be Cockroach. You can just you can run several standalone Postgres instances with read replicas, etc. Up to you, many options. But if you want, let's say, to scale both reads and writes, and you want to be highly available and compliant, full tolerant, then probably distributed SQL database mm -hmm. like Google Spanner or Yugabyte DB. Yeah. Uh, and final one is geo distributed cluster that we discussed the last that's that one is supported by modern sql databases such as yugabyte db again single database cluster but you have a group of nodes in each region that keeps the data local and the latency low but mm -hmm. you as a trade-off you need to do a change at the application level you need to introduce that column a special column to your table that helps the database to decide where to put this data yeah makes sense uh, as you mentioned, you know, if the primary goes down and your replica is, you know, uh, waiting for bec becoming the new primary and that takes a lot of time. So I have seen primary going down at least three times uh, in my entire career. And that took like 
really 20, 30 minutes uh, for the replica to become the new primary because, mm -hmm. you know, when things go wrong, uh, it it is not able to come back as a primary. There are some issues, then the data infra team is working on it. Um, you have huge data, uh, you have huge replication lag. So before it happens, it cannot become the primary and all that. So when things go wrong, it really, like every minute feels like a long time. So it's best to, you know, look at the trade-offs, what you might have selecting different architectural style. And based on that, I think the modern distributed SQL databases is a great choice because they support all these natively. And you as a application developer, as a, uh, as a database user, you don't need to worry about all those, you know, failure modes, all those distribution, how things are working. What you have to worry about is modeling your data. As you mentioned, there should be a column to identify, you know, what region or location or data center or whatever you name it, uh, sh should this data belong to. With this, I have a question. Um, as you mentioned, there should be this column which needs to be, you know, uh, there with all the tables, or it can be like a like a foreign key to a certain table which has all the, you know, location details. So, do I have? Let's say I taking the example of the pizza service, right? So, let's say I have an orders table and I have a customers table. So the uh, the region is. Uh, you know, the region column exists in the customer table, but do I have to also make it available in the, in the orders table or the customer ID field in the order table can point to then the customer table and then a region can be identified. So how does that work? I can speak for Yuga by DB. I can explain how it works uh, at Yuga by DB. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to add, add this column to every table okay. that you want to partition like this way based on the location of your yeah mm. of your data which means that if you group if you segment your customers also mm. based on the locations same as orders then both the customer and the order table uh, need to have this special column but let's say if you have uh, some other table that, mm. that is sort of global sh shared and it's the, the data is exactly the same across all of the locations, then you don't need to have this column. In this case, but in this case, this table can be replicated across multiple nodes. Let's say that you have your product catalog table. Mm. And probably this product catalog, we don't update it frequently, I right? know, like yeah. once a year when we just change the recipe, etc. And this yeah. table in our geo-distributed uh, cluster deployments is global, meaning that, let's say, for one product, like for, for let's say, deep dish super pizza, the primary copy of this pizza record is stored in India. And the mm. backup copy of this record is stored in London and in Germany. Uh, which means that from each location you have in Yuga by DB, you have a concept of the follower read that allows, let's say, to, to read from the primary copy and from the backup copy, which means that still the reads can be fast, doesn't matter. But mm. when it comes to the update, let's say you, we sit in Berlin and right, right now we decided to introduce a change to this deep dish super pizza, just some ingredients. And we need to update the database record. We send this request from Berlin because we live in Berlin. Mm -hmm. But as long as the primary copy of this record is stored in Mumbai, the first write goes to Mumbai. Yeah. It's updated there. And the nodes from Mumbai replicate this change synchronously to London and to back to back to Berlin. Mm -hmm. But as long as this doesn't happen frequently, we usually do this that's fine. This yeah. data is global. We can read, let's say, from the primary and from the backup copies. Mm -hmm. Reads are fast. And yeah. we do, when we do the change, we do this change. And for this type of data, for this table, we don't need to have this uh, uh, special column. Mm. But okay. for orders and for customers that we've got, let's say, daily new orders and new customers, yeah, the data is local. We have this column and the data is kept local, let's say, in India or in, or in London or in Berlin. Yeah. And this, is, say, this is, this is yeah, for the geo-distributed cluster because this is I see that they're trying to get to deep dive because many, many, many developers get excited about mm -hmm. this type of deployment because it's just sounds simple. It comes with some of the advantages when it comes to multiple standalone cluster deployments. But still, there are some trade-offs and uh, the right questions. You're asking the right questions. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I mean... You you explained some of the things like how these things might work out and, you know, you need to think about the region part of your table uh, right from the beginning. Uh, but let's say someone is not thinking enough and, you know, they need to 
uh, suddenly they start thinking, okay, you know, I, I use Yuga by DB, for example, but then I don't have the region column just because I, I wasn't aware that, you know, it needs to be there. And I suddenly want to, you know, have that column in all tables. Is there a, is there a way I can quickly do that? Or I just have to, you know, do the old school, um, you know, process like update all the tables and, you know, backfill the data and, and whatnot, or there's a, there's a quick way to, you know, do it. I mean, two options. The old school way is when you would say stand up and you, you go by DB cluster and then you could create the column, you then synchronize data, etc. Or you just do this in runtime with your current database mm. cluster because you can add this column, you can, you can add this column to the table, then you need to go ahead and update that initialize the column of this table for every yeah. record. Once this happens, the data is going to be reshuffled, right? Yeah. Because the nodes that right now own this record. Mm. Uh, so two ways, two options. But generally, my advice would be to application developers, don't overthink when it comes, when you need to scale, let's say, probably in the beginning, most of the, even if you work for a big company, when we start, we usually start, like we, when we introduce a new service, we usually start small. And then if the service becomes success, then you can grow bigger. Yeah. What matters is in the beginning is to design and build the applications in this geo-distributed way. Mm. What I mean? Probably nobody will give you, like even when we, when we, we are talking about our first instance of the pizza service, right? When the first days of our startup, we just deployed everything in a single region uh, somewhere in nearby Germany, nearby nearby Berlin, which yeah. is fine. Mm. But when you do this, also do this in a geo-distributed way, meaning that you have this region, you created your application, deploy your application across multiple availability zones, one to three, three application instances. Yeah. You configure that global load balancer. It's going to be region load balancer, but still, mm. the load balancer will decide what application instance from which availability zone will serve the request. Mm. And from the database standpoint, up to you, you can run vanilla Postgres with the replicas. You can use Aurora, you can use Google or ODB, whatever you can, or you can yeah. run Postgres open source, etc. But again, at least with the replicas. And that's already a geo-distributed solution because we, today we were discussing with you, let's say, this example over pizza chain across multiple countries, like the world map. But in reality, a geo-distributed application, it's also an application that runs within a single region yeah. across multiple availability zones. And please yeah. do this. If you follow this practice, you already can approbate and validate your geo-distributed mm. solution within one region just by, by, by using several availability zones. Yeah. Once the time comes, once you need to expand to other regions, probably because you go nationwide or because right now we're expanding to London, Paris, and Madrid, you just take your existing solution, you take your existing code, you deploy your application instances just in other cloud locations. You you reconfigure your cloud load balancer telling that right now in addition to that application instance in Berlin I have something in London, Madrid and uh, Paris yeah. and from the database perspective if you were on Postgres with the replicas and if you right now want to scale region rights and you want to extend region level outages etc with mm -hmm. quick failover because with Yugabyte DB and other any other distributed SQL database the failover is low it's usually maybe 10 seconds like 3-5 seconds and then the other nodes will be serving traffic. Then just be great, let's say, to Yuga by DB if that's the case, because Yuga by DB is, is built on Postgres SQL. Basically, it's a fork of Postgres SQL. Mm. And this is easier for you. But again, yeah. do, do, do the baby steps. The first, the first right choice here would be, all right, I want my service, I want my application to become a success, which means that it's going to run across several states across several countries, which means mm -hmm. that my application is going to be geo-distributed. But right now, I'm a startup. I'm just, I've just started. I don't want, yeah. I don't want to waste my money running this whole infrastructure across several regions, but yeah, start within, within a single region, but across multiple ability zones. And the once yeah. the time comes, we will scale and we will scale easily. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Start with, you know, simple steps, but, you know, keep all these tips and tricks and design principles in mind. So you don't have to pay a lot of cost when, you know, you have to make those changes. You have to scale suddenly into, you know, different geographical locations. Uh, with this, I think we have covered the networking part. We have covered the data, uh, you know, the data layer, uh, including the databases. Uh, we also briefly touched on the application, right? Because the application probably in this uh, perspective is the simplest part because these are like stateless applications. Uh, if I have like a stateful application, does it make it a little more, more complicated or it's almost the same given that the data layer and the networking layer itself are, you know, globally distributed? I mean, I, I don't think there is a, there are going to be much difference. Mm -hmm. From the application, like from the application uh, perspective, yeah, the application can certainly keep the user session data, right? Yeah. Uh, but let's say it's not a big deal if you, you have some session session management solutions when the session can be replicated across several yeah. locations, which means that even if, let's say, your application instance, if a cloud region goes down in all of the application instances and database nodes, go down in that region, the load balancer will be redirecting the traffic to another location. And if yeah. the session was replicated for your users, literally no any change, right? Probably yeah. just you need to look like how, how, so that you don't want your users to be impacted at all, then just mm. find how to replicate the session. You can use the session sessions. solutions, you can use something that is provided by the cloud uh, uh, vendor out of the box. But then let's say, whether you are running a monolith or you go that microservices way, again, no much difference. If you are running a monolith application, then you just have one application instance and it's easy to deploy it across multiple cloud regions. If you, yeah. let's say, run microservices, then make sure that, let's say you have 10 microservices for some reason, make sure that you have a microservice instance an instance of each microservice in every cloud location. If those microservices communicate through an API layer, let's say you have some API gateway like such as Corn, Corn gateway, mm -hmm. then again, you can deploy Corn instance in every cloud region. And here is, let's imagine this, this use case. You have your primary microservice and probably this mm -hmm. primary microservice uh, accepts a request. In our case with the pizza, it can be, let's say, some backend microservice that shows the product catalog, right? Yeah. And by default, the load balancer, the global load balancer, will send all of the user requests to this microservice instance. So that microservice instance gets the request. It, re it responds to the user with a list of product catalogs, with the, with the list of the pizzas available, and you just make your pizza. But then you want to buy the pizza. Mm. And this request needs to be processed by a payment, like an, an odd, like a microservice that is responsible for the orders. Yeah. And this needs to happen within the same cloud region. So again, mm. the microservice instance, the, the main backend instance from one cloud region, it can send an API call to the code gateway to that uh, payment processing microservice. And you have, it's, it's all local. You have this con yeah. gateway instance in the same cloud region. It's yeah. like, think about, let's say, like, like cellular network. You have different cells in different locations and every mm -hmm. cell comes with the same type of deployment. You have 10 microservices in each cloud region and needs to have that uh, instance of the microservice. If those microservices use some gateway or API layer to, to talk yeah. to each other, again, make sure that the gateway is deployed in every location close to the microservices and the instances of the microservices use the gateway from their location. If let's say the location goes down, then everything from this location goes down. And mm. then you can just rely on your load balancer because the load balancer will be re redirected to another cloud location. So in my case, this is not the only one solution architecture you can come up with, but this yeah. one is probably the most straightforward. You just duplicate the instances of applications, API gateways, or streaming platforms across of those locations. And then just if everything goes down, just let, uh, let's say, the load balancer to do the hard job redirecting yep. to the other locations. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that makes sense. I mean, given the uh, the complexity of the application, it's not that complicated. It's basically doing the IO operations and, you know, talking to the database and talking to some other services. So this should be working, you know, very well. And uh, I'm pretty satisfied with uh, our pizza service and the way it was, you know, scaling and the way it has reached like thousands and millions of people and they love our pizza. So I'm really excited. Uh, that we, you know, did this and uh, I'm really excited to learn um, what it takes to build a geo distribution distributed application and uh, what does it mean and what are the different, uh, you know, possible solutions or deployment models that we have uh, talking about networking layer, application layer and the database layer. So I thank you again, Dennis, uh, for, you know, uh, joining me in this episode and, you know, sharing all the insights that you have. For our viewers, I would really want to point you all to uh, Dennis's blogs. He has written uh, blogs on geo-distributed applications, how he, you know, started developing those and, you know, how he scaled uh, developing uh, the applications. So I'll link all those blogs in the uh, description so you can all take a look, you can understand more in depth. But I'm sure uh, after watching this episode, you're going to learn a lot about your distributed applications, especially if you haven't really worked on them um, ever. So yeah, thanks, Dennis. If you want to add something more as a, as a conclusion, as a tip for all those developers who are you know looking forward to building distributed applications, uh, please uh, share, F please feel free to share. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, like uh, just in case, because I think that we made it crystal clear through this conversation. A geo-distributed application, you know, is just a, a good definition for the apps that run across multiple availability zones or multiple mm -hmm. regions. And folks, please, if you go into the cloud, especially public cloud environment, don't just, you know, think that you are going to get reliability, fast speed out of the box. Yeah. Unless you use everything, all of, like, unless you're application is packaged of the managed services from the cloud provider that are already full tolerant, global, etc. Yeah, you need to look into this and you need to design in this geo distributed way. And I will repeat once again, the easiest way to start because on, on, only a few of us would deploy the first version of an application across multiple regions, mm -hmm. which means that but does it mean that you are not, you cannot build those types of apps, you can build but just deploy across multiple availability zones within a region. And this way you will learn in practice what it means to architect and design and build those types of apps. And then your colleagues and your business owners will be grateful to you. Because like those availability zones will go down, but your yeah. solution will be up and running. And then if they, when, whenever they will decide to scale, you will be able to do that easy. And final one, man, I, I want to eat. I, I, I said, like, we talked so much about pizza that I'll go and do, <laughs> do a pizza right now and wish everyone to do that, right? Whenever you yeah. go and order <laughs> a pizza, a pizza from your favorite favorite chain, because we are not, we have not opened our pizza chain yet. Yeah. Once we do this, we will let you know. We will let you know. <laughs> Absolutely, we'll do another podcast if we ever do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we will explain. Yeah. We will explain. We will explain all the challenges that we faced. Uh, uh, but yeah, I agree. I mean, moving to cloud does not mean it will solve your problem. Cloud only enables you to solve your own problems, but just it doesn't solve your problems, right? So you need to do, you still need to do, do the right things. You need to have the right configuration and the right understanding of your application, how it works. Um, great. So thanks a lot, everyone for watching. And if you haven't subscribed so far, please do that. And, you know, more episodes are coming soon. So thanks a lot for listening. And thank you, Dennis, uh, for coming to the show again. My pleasure. Thanks a lot.